and welcome back to the channel with probably a catchphrase to be honest where we've moved on to B. Everything is interesting. Today B is for Boondoggles, Berlin and Brown. And as always, if you have some topics I want you want me to talk about, beginning with B or with C, just send me an email to everything is very interesting at gmail.com and you may get this piece of paper in the mail. Boondoggle. It's a fantastic word, and it's also a word which nobody really knows where it comes from. I mean, if you look at it, look at it up, you try to figure out what it actually came from. It just seems to be just a playful word. But the word itself is kind of useful. It means a project which costs way too much money and ends up being pretty worthless. But we didn't really need to do it. It's a waste of time and a waste of money. But we did it anyway, um, even though we sort of realized it was a bad idea. Now, the reason I mention this is not because I really want to talk too much about boondoggles, but I want to mention some experiences I've had, and also where we, in history, see lots of money being spent in ways that are surprising, I suppose, and sometimes wasteful, but maybe not in the way that we think. So, without mentioning too many examples of boondoggles, we'll get to them. What I do want to talk about, quite a lot, is Berlin. Berlin, of course, is the capital of Germany. And it is a singularly interesting capital city. It is unique in the world. Um, if you've been there, you very quickly notice something quite fascinating about um, Berlin. Berlin is subdivided into two halves. Now, it used to be completely subdivided into East Berlin and West Berlin back after the Second World War. It was cut in two once the Germans had lost the war. It was chopped into two sides. West Berlin was basically controlled by the Americans and the East side was basically controlled by the Soviet Union. So it was physically subdivided into two separate cities right next to each other, of course, with a wall, the Berlin Wall. The Berlin Wall became a symbol of so much during the Cold War, where you had like East versus, East versus West in a very sort of direct, noticeable way. Right? Now, the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, a long time ago, um, but the wall is, in a sense, still there. It's not like the, the, the Soviets are still running East Berlin, absolutely not, but you can tell when you're there. You can notice, you, you kind of know that you're in East Berlin, uh, even without using the clue of the little green man, the little red man as, as well. The interesting thing is if you're waiting at a cross section in West Berlin, you have the basic green and red men who look like everywhere else on Earth. However, on the east side of town, it's the classic East Berlin man who's become sort of like a, a symbol, really. You can get him on T-shirts and mugs and stuff, but he's like a, a cheerful little chappy. It's quite more, a lot more personality than the, the West Berlin standard version, which isn't surprising when you really think about how incredibly boring the red and green men actually are. They're so iconographified that, you know, nobody gives a shit about what they look like. So anything that has any kind of personality uh, is better than that, right? Anyway, you notice this stuff quite easily. My pens are running out so much. I'm really trying to learn this. Not really. Um... <clears throat> You notice other things, because what happened was, once the Berlin Wall came down, it turned out that a lot of these locations and houses and places in East Berlin were pretty run down and broken, and sort of not the best places in the world to really you know, live. So it didn't attract um, the kind of real estate developers that you'd expect, possibly, would be interested in kind of things like that. So what you got was uh, students and anarchists and poets and bohem types of all stripes and colours who sort of settled into East Berlin because it was affordable, you know, nobody really else really wanted to live there, and you always get that kind of sort of counterculture in that kind of situation. So the, this strange vibe of East Berlin, which is absolutely still there today, um, developed because of this economic reality that you know, West Berlin was more attractive to normal people, so where do all these sort of radicals and anarchists and exciting left-wing uh, people and all these, you know, 
people with different ideas and all the artists and all that kind of stuff. They went to East Berlin, and you can sense it. Even in 2020, if you go to East Berlin, there is this definite feel to it, that it's a different place. So Berlin has been subdivided. Um, and Berlin also memorializes this. You still find sides, you still find pieces of the Berlin Wall round, round about, um, memorizing, or remembering all what happened. Because, of course, it was subdivided because of the war. And the war was an awful thing. And Germany is very respectable in the sense that it's very, very good at remembering, honestly, what went on. It's very honest about what happened. Um, and much more honest than most other countries are, because all countries have really ugly histories hiding away in their sort of in their past, which they don't really like to talk about. We talked a little bit about Belgium and how they're not really all that aware of um, of King Leopold II and the Congo and all that kind of stuff. And certainly, the UK has a lot of bad conscience that it needs to work through if it wants to be good, feel good about itself again. But Germany is pretty good at it. It has a quite fascinating memorial uh, for the Holocaust, right on the edge between East Berlin and West Berlin, right by the Brandenburger Tor. There is a a uh, memorial for the Holocaust, which I can't explain to you. <laughs> it's I can tell you what it is. It's just a bunch of of concrete pillars. Uh, of different heights and sort of like an oscillating floor and you walk between them and that's it and I remember thinking why does this memorialize the holocaust it doesn't does it it doesn't really make much sense and all I can tell you is if you go there and you walk around there trying to figure out what it's trying to tell you then suddenly you get it and I don't I don't want to tell you what you get because I can't really put it into words to be honest you just get the sense that it works. That's at least what I got. Um, so I certainly would like to invite you to think about these things. Um, so I have interesting memories from Berlin. I also visit the, visited the headquarters of Stasi, which was the East Berlin, well, really East Germany, uh, secret police, which was huge and basically just controlled every aspect of the East German life which is horrifying to think about, um, but it was very, very, very controlling. And visiting the headquarters really gave you a sense of how completely inside the normal person's life this was. This was a daily thing. You had to always consider, is the state listening to what I'm saying? Which is absolutely horrifying. Um, but anyway, Berlin is a subdivided city with the weight of history upon it. And what I want to tell you is two sides of the Second World War. That's really what I want to talk about today. Two sides of the Second World War. Just like Berlin has two sides to it, the Second World War has two sides to it. And I don't want to talk about, like, communist versus capitalist kind of thing, which was this real subdivision between East and West Berlin. That's not what I want to talk about. I also don't want to talk about the Allied forces versus the Axis powers kind of thing, the political military subdivision in World War Two, I don't want to talk about that either. I want to talk about two sides to humanity and two sides of what it means to be strong. And it's, I want to talk about what walls can do and what they can't do. So let's talk about a wall. Not the Berlin Wall, but the Maginot Line. The Maginot Line was built by the French after the First World War. Now, I think it's almost a cliché to say that the Second World War is really just the sequel, the inevitable sequel of the First World War. I mean, it is... It's an echo of the First World War. But the First World War was, of course, when Germany became aggressive and attacked um, through Belgium into France and decided to... Well, kind of hoped to sort of subjugate France very, very quickly in the Schlieffen Plan. Uh... Basically, it hoped to run in their armies straight into um, France, knock out France as quickly as they can before they really knew anything, and then turn the army around and get to Russia and knock out those people as well. Uh, knock out the Russians, because the Russian army is slow to mobilize. 
So the plan was, if you go in and knock out the French with all your army as quickly as you possibly can, and then turn around and get your army back to to, to um, Russian front before the Russians are ready, then you win. Then you basically get to use your army twice. That was the plan. Um, the Schlieffen plan failed miserably, of course, because of all kinds of reasons I want to get into now, but it definitely did fail. And we ended up with this trench warfare which defines World War One, and it was an absolutely terrible thing. The Maginot Line was a boondoggle, in a sense. An incredibly expensive project by the French to avoid the same kind of problem happening again. They did not want the Germans to attack from their border between Germany and France. So they build basically a wall. It's basically a trench, the same kind of thing that you had in the First World War. It's a trench. But it is the fanciest bloody trench you will ever see. It's insane. The amount of money poured into this Maginot line is just ridiculously impressive. They spent... I tried to calculate this. It was a bit complicated to do, because how do you translate old francs into money with inflation calculators and stuff? But I got to a, a number which was about 3 billion euros... <clears throat> now, 3 billion euros is a lot of cash. Please don't fight me on that one. It's a lot of money. And for those 3 billion euros, what they built, the French, was a line between France and Germany, which is a pretty substantial border, let's not forget. It. I mean, it runs from uh, Luxembourg in the north all the way down to... Well, I can't even picture it now. Does it get there? It doesn't get to Spain, right? Austria? No, it's nothing either. Sorry. <laughs> My brain just broke there for a second. That was embarrassing. I know what it is, I just can't think. Um, why would I say Austria? That's not on that side. Oh, God, what's my brain doing right now? Never mind. Um, it's, it's a huge chunk of land, at least. And this trench is the most insane James Bond villainy kind of place you could possibly imagine. Like, they have turrets coming out of the ground, retractable turrets, no less. Uh, the kind of stuff where you sort of have these... these uh, turrets that can shoot at the Germans, but they kind of grow out of the ground. Like, um, and they come out of the ground and shoot the Germans, and then they go back in again. It's super, super James Bond base kind of thing. And underneath you have like a hundred miles, I think, of railroads, electrified railroads, run, like metros, basically. Like, And there's layers and layers and layers of underground departments, and there's like entertainments, and hospitals, and movie theatres for the soldiers, and all kinds of stuff. This thing was built uh, to withstand any kind of trench warfare uh, attacks that the Germans could throw at them. Basically, the French could just stay there forever, having fun, and watching movies, and attacking them with their James Bond turrets. An incredible amount of, I mean, from an engineering standpoint, it's just insane what they did. Um, that was the Maginot Line. And they built this all along, as I say, the French-German border, um, until you get to the Luxembourgian-Belgian bit, in which they say, oh, well, you know, that's not directly uh, Germany, is it? I mean, that's, that's Belgium. Belgium's not scary, just, that's just Belgium. So they kind of gave up <laughs> on that one. They basically said, yeah, but that's kind of a swampy, swampy bit, so if... If the Germans go that way, we'll have lots of time to get our French soldiers up there anyway, so we won't extend the Maginot Line that far. That's too expensive, which it certainly would have been. So they didn't. They made like a soft Maginot Line uh, in that area. Now bear in mind that what the Germans did in the, second, the First World War was to move through Belgium into France. Right? Now, in the Second World War, Hitler took the really exciting modern thought, and guess what he did? He, um, he moved through Belgium into France. <laughs> he went around the Maginot Line um, and went into France. And because the, the French hadn't really thought this through, they were too complacent, they felt too safe with the Maginot Line, they didn't respond in time, and the Germans basically knocked out France in the Second World War really, really quickly. And the French had no real... Um, role in Second World War, aside from resistance, they were basically just conquered by the Nazis immediately. And the Maginot Line did nothing. That's why I called it a boondoggle. Uh, it was a waste of money in that sense. Um, and in fact, the Maginot Line has become a symbol, almost. Like, it's a, it's a, it's a metaphor now. 
by you call something imagino line if it's like gives you a sort of false sense of security if you like feel oh i'm safe nothing's gonna happen to me now i have this and this and then you just messed up anyway that sense of false security is termed imagino line you feel you hear people talking about internet security in these terms. They're just like, oh, you have, like, encryption? Okay, sure, but what about this, this, and this? You think you're safe, but you're not. It's basically a Maginot line. It's become, like, this symbol. So that's kind of embarrassing for fans, right? But definitely a boondoggle, right? Three billion euros and it did nothing? That's, that's not great at all. So the Maginot line is really also a way of introducing this first side of humanity I want to talk about, the sense of strength that Hitler is so obsessed with. Because if anybody, if, if you've looked even slightly into the history of, of Hitler and his, his politics, if you go a little bit deeper than just the, the anti-Semitism, horrible, you know, fascist bullshit he pulls out, he also has this really obsessive sense of strength in, in, in the Aryan race, and like, oh, the, the, you know, the, the Ubermensch and all these kind of things. And you've got to ask yourself where this comes from, because that's a huge part of, of the Second World War. It's this sort of view on humans, you know, what humans look like and what great humans can do. Um, and on this side of the equation, on this side of this wall, we have the, the view on humanity, the view on humans, which is basically um, humans can do whatever they want as long as they sort of reject you know, old morals and standards, you can just conquer. You can take what you need. You can take what you want. This is basically from Nietzsche. Nietzsche, the uh, rather antisocial philosopher, who... I'm sorry. I'm trying to paint like this because I'm getting filth on my painting from leaning here. See? Exciting technical details. So I'm going to do something else. I'm going to go over here. Uh, uh, sorry. I'll work on this bit. Okay, um, while it dries. So, yeah, we have this Nietzsche. Nietzsche is the edgiest man in the world. If you ever sort of look, at a picture of, look at a picture of Nietzsche, you'll see he has the biggest mustache in the world, and he also died of syphilis. You can't really see that on a picture, but if you look at him, you kind of can. You kind of see that's the kind of guy who's going to die of syphilis, to be honest. Um, he's, uh, and he went crazy, so he went into a mental institution because of the syphilis, and then he died while he was batshit insane. So he's not... He's not my favourite philosopher. I understand that he appeals <laughs> to some people, especially when you first like discover him and you're like a teenager and just like, oh my god, he's saying so much edgy shit. But he's basically the kind of person who just says like, why should we do what the man tells us to do? Why should we follow like Christian morality? That does nothing. You know, we just, you know, why don't we just take what's ours, you know, just take the strength. And he has this concept of the Ubermensch, which means overhuman. The sense that a human as whole is held back by his morality. And if you can just reject him all that kind of stuff, he can become stronger and do, you know, just take what's yours, for God's sake. Rah! So he's this edgy guy, right? And he's a philosopher, so he can say what he wants. Nobody cares. <laughs> Nobody really listens to philosophers until somebody does. And then all hell breaks loose. And what happens is that Hitler, he, he's inspired quite a lot by this Ubermensch philosophy. And of course, we all know that he has this idea of, like, strength. If you're strong, you can do what the hell you want. So that's basically Hitler. But the thing is, though, you always find these morons. Um, it's not difficult to find people who have these attitudes. Why was he able to, you know, get elected? Why was he able to sort of start a war on this kind of stuff? Why doesn't he just get ignored? To get that picture, I think we have to understand German self-identity in the beginning of the 30s, really, to understand what's actually going on here. Why would a person like Hitler really get elected? Now, it goes back, I think, to the to what? Of course, it goes back to the First World War, the way they, they lose and all the sanctions that come from that. But we need to look at Germany's history from a little, a little deeper perspective. Now, Germany as a country is really young. That surprises a lot of people who don't know, but Germany has no unified history until about the 1800s. Um, comparing that to all the other countries in Europe, that's nothing. Like, if you look at this is my country, you know, we have we have history going back like a thousand years. And you've got France, and they've got ancient history, you've got Spain, you've got, you know, it, all these countries have like hundreds and hundreds of years of history. And, you know, Germany doesn't. Germany just has, um, as I say, a couple of hundred years. So Germany 
gets unified into the German Empire in the 1800s, and they kind of have to find their place as a country in Europe. And basically, they try to define themselves in the First World War. That's really what the First World War is kind of about. It's about, like, saying, Hello, we're Germans! We can do cool stuff! We have taken over your continent! Hooray! And that didn't work at all. So we end up with a Germany which is really sort of embarrassed, really. An embarrassed nation. An embarrassed, powerful nation. You, you, it, it tried and it failed, right? And not only did it fail, but it was really feeling it. Germany between the wars is messed up. They have nothing. They are so poor. They are so ruined by all kinds of um, economic sanctions from the Versailles Treaty. They have nothing they can sort of hang their hat on, really. It's just, it's just oh my god. I mean, they have this hyperinflation. They're... they're, they're um, the economy is completely smacked down to nothing, and you have these photos of um, German people basically lighting fires with banknotes because their money is worth nothing. All this kind of stuff. Super destructive, super destroyed. Um, Germany is deeply embarrassed. There are other elements to this embarrassment. We also get, if we go to Africa, we look at the German colonies in Africa. Now, we talked about this before. We talked about what the Belgians did. Um, but, of course, the Belgians were not the only people having colonies. There was this huge scramble for Africa where the European uh, superpowers kind of decided that, oh, we need Africa because there's lots of you know, goodies there, um, and we just basically want it. So it became like, who can get Africa, who can get the bits of Africa um, the quickest, really? It became a race, a very, very, very immoral race <laughs> where we did not care about an entire continent's worth of people and what they might have wanted, because no, 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 we just want Africa because there's, there's goodies. Um, and what happened was that you know Britain and France got a good chunk of it. Italy got a little bit too. But once Germany kind of came into being as a nation and was able to even scramble for Africa, not much of Africa was really left. So they got like these little chunks of Africa. Uh, so that if you look at a map of it, you can see that it's just it's the leftovers. You know, there's nothing. They don't really have much. <clears throat> um, they don't really have much to uh, to be proud of, basically. And you know, they lost that too, of course. Uh, as long as along with everything else, once they lost the First World War, they had to give up all their sort of African territories. So what we have here is a, is a country which defined itself as powerful, sees itself as powerful, and wants to be powerful, and is just humiliated on the national stage. And the international stage is just destroyed. It loses everything. And it also loses all kinds of economic power and strength and all this kind of stuff. Everybody's poor. Everybody's hungry. Nothing is working. All the politicians can't do anything to change this. That's the situation where Hitler comes along and says, we can do this, guys. We can do this. We can be strong. We just have to sort of embrace this powerful Aryan German shape of powers and like strength, and we'll just do what we want. And we'll blame the Jews, too, by the way, just like a little thing. Side note. Um, that's not a side note at all, of course, but it's... <laughs> uh, People went along with it. There's a reason he got elected. It, it because, you know, the, they were desperate to refine themselves after such a huge, humiliating defeat on the world stage. It it didn't work for them. So that's how he rises up, and he becomes this guy who says, "Well, as long as we have this strong unity and the faceless power of Arianism, we can do all this kind of stuff." And then we get to what Hitler does, which really flabbergasts the world, really impresses the world. Now, I, it's very difficult for me to sort of give you a sense of how impressive Hitler manages to do something here, but he really stuns the world with a boondoggle all his own, with a massive project. Uh, we're talking, you know, again, billions of euros, maybe two billion euros this time, but a bunch of money, 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 um, to do something... Incredibly impressive. What he does... Now, let me just see if I can put this into a context first. Let's imagine you have a country which is completely ruined uh, by, 
by debt and bad decisions and war and all kinds of stuff. Something like Zimbabwe or something. Or North Korea. Let's take North Korea. To so have North Korea, which in 2020 is a completely destroyed country. I mean, it has it has nothing. People are starving on the streets and the, the economy is broken and nobody's happy and everything like that. Now imagine that in 2024, North Korea hosts the most utterly impressive, futuristic, wild-looking, crazy extravaganza transmitted live over the internet in, in 4K resolution where everything just looks like it's from the future and everything works fantastically and there's money everywhere and everything looks absolutely batshit crazy cool. And there's new technology everywhere. I mean, the internet is not even impressive enough. It has to be something even more wild than transmitting on the internet, because we can do that already. But something even more crazy, like the he North Korea emails, like virtual reality headsets, not emails, uh, physically snail mails, virtual reality headsets to every person on Earth. They can put it on and they can basically be in this, this event. Something like that. Just absolutely wild. Now, I'm pretty sure that if that happened, we would all be like, what? the hell? North Korea? Well, people, how the hell did they do this? And you'd be kind of impressed. It'd just be like, okay, I, that, I did not see that coming. This is what Hitler does, because he hosts the 1936 Olympics. And that happened in 1936, boys and girls, believe it or not. Um, and in 1936, this is where the uh, the German economy has been decimated after the First World War for you know a decade or more. And here comes the first, here comes these 11th Olympic Games. And it just is insane. It is transmitted live on television, live across the world in 1936, mind you. Um, it looks fantastic. I mean, he spends so much money, like he's basically decorated Berlin like a movie set. He has a movie made, Lady Riefenstahl makes this movie called Olympia, which is just also just crazy and basically invents all kinds of new techniques for visualizing sports and it looks like something from the future. Everything just looks like something from the future. And it's just it's just pompous and wild and grand and huge and impressive in every possible way. Now, please don't think that I'm saying that Hitler's a great person, because of course he's a dickhead. Everybody knows this. But he really impressed the world with this this move. And he impresses it in exactly the way he wants to. He says, look what Germans can do. Look how strong we are when we put our minds to it. When we sort of reject all this nonsense, we can you know, produce this incredible show of strength, because that's what it is. And it's a massively racist show of strength, of course. No Jews are allowed to you know, p take part in the Olympic Games. Duh. I mean, Jesus, can you imagine? And it's all glorifying Hitler to the most absurd degree. If you look at the, the way... He, uh, you know, he, these films exist, of course, Olympia exists, and it's all just like, hooray for the Nazis, hooray for Hitler, every bloody thing is just like, hooray, hooray, hooray. Um, and, of course, Hitler is known to be a fascist already uh, in this time, so people are a little bit, like, unnerved by, by the sort of fascist glorification, but, you know, the fascists have never actually done anything bad yet. They would do, but they haven't done it at the time. So everybody was just like, nah, I'm not quite sure this is how I want uh, the most powerful, one of the most powerful countries in the world to act, but I'm not quite sure what I really have to say against it, because, you know, they're just fascists. I mean, what have they done? So, you know, there was this un unnerving sense to the whole thing, but when you watch it now, of course, it, it, it hurts to look at, because, my God, I mean, they're the Nazis, and they've got lots of power. But the point is, it looks amazing. Uh, and people were blown away, and they were all, like, going, like, my God, Germany has really risen from the ashes here. It just it impressed the world a lot. A uh, side note, by the way, since this was one of the first um, live transmissions to, to, the, to the Earth, you know, live transmissions globally, it's pretty much the first signal that the Earth has sent into space, um, because that's how live transmissions work. It's by radio, so it's it's an unencrypted analog system. So it, basically, aliens would be able to decrypt this and watch it, which means that the first impression that aliens will get from Earth is um, a huge demonstration of how Hitler's great. <laughs> so I'm just saying that might get awkward at some point. I'm just saying this, this could be something we might want to explain, that we're not quite as happy about Hitler as, as your first impressions might be seen, Mr. Alien. Just saying. Um, 
so yes. Also, just to, to make sure that I, I don't glorify Hitler at all in this uh, segment, I should point out that um, <laughs> that they released 25,000 pigeons. Or doves, I suppose. I suppose. I think they were pigeons, but they can I don't know. I don't know what's more expensive. But um, they released 25,000 doves, let's say that, um, as part of a ceremony to introduce the, the, the things. And that looks great, of course. Like, 25,000 doves, oh, wow. Um, and they fired off cannons to sort of show um, superiority and like, hooray, we got cannons. But the thing is, though, when you have 25,000 doves or pigeons in the sky and you fire off a massive cannon, these poor pigeons were quite scared. So they all crapped themselves in the sky and it rained with dove shit all over the Nazis, <laughs> which somehow is a very satisfying thought. Um, and you could hear it, apparently, on the recordings. You could hear, like, this pat pitter patter of shit landing on the straw hats. <laughs> which, which is amusing. Um, and Nazi flags. So how happening? Because, of course, they did have Nazi flags all over the place uh, during this this uh, Olympic. It's all very weird. But definitely a show of force. And also, the Germans won a lot. They won almost twice as many medals as the... The, uh, the second place. They definitely won those Olympics, and the second place was the US. It was all very symbolic and stuff, blah, blah. Um, but certainly impressive, right? What else did he do which was impressive? Oh, by the way, just one thing. <laughs> one of the things that the 1936 Olympics discovered was that because this was, you know, a big Olympics and many countries were competing together on this world stage for the first time, they discovered that the nations of Haiti and the nation of Liechtenstein had the exact same flag. Like, the exactly the same flag. And nobody had noticed this before, because why would you compare Haiti and Liechtenstein? <laughs> right? Because they hung up all the flags of all the countries, and then somebody said, like, wait, what? That's the same flag. And everybody's like, oh, shit, that's right. So Haiti changed their flag. They put a, on one of them. I think Haiti changed the flag. They put a little crown on it or something to sort of distinguish themselves from Liechtenstein. It's kind of funny, isn't it? So imagine that these countries are just like, wait, we have the same flag. Why didn't anybody see this before? That's cute, right? Anyway, to move on to German superiority in other ways. I was you know, saying that Germany really impressed the world with these Olympics because they were technologically super impressive. Now, something else that Germany did, which was technologically super impressive, but also a huge show of strength, was the V2 rocket. The V2 rocket is basically the world's first rocket that could reach space. And it is used as a missile to bomb the shit out of, of um, Hitler's enemies. It's developed, it runs on, it's actually, the fascinating thing about V2 rockets is that they wanted to produce as many as these, of these V2 rockets as they possibly could, and it turns out that that was dependent on potatoes. You heard me, it was dependent on potatoes. And the reason it's dependent on potatoes is that um, it ran on a mixture of, um, of alcohol and water, 75% alcohol. And alcohol was made by fermenting potatoes. So the potato harvest was actually the thing that limited Nazi Germany from making <laughs> more V2 rockets than they could. So basically, you know, there was a potato farmer somewhere in the Nazi Empire uh, being, like, called up by the top military brass of Nazism. And they're like, where are my potatoes? <laughs> and the guy's just like, why are my potatoes so important? They're like, we need your potatoes to bomb London and Antwerp. And he's like, what? That's got a bit of a confusing conversation. But I don't think you can even call people, to be honest, at that time. I don't know. Anyway, who cares? Um, the V2 rockets are intensely modern compared to when you think about it. Let's just remember, these are developed in the 40s, right? The 1940s. That's 80 years ago. 80 years ago. In 1940, you don't have nothing which is even close to to sort of technological stuff. We're still like way back in the day. I mean, the car has been invented for like 30 years. Or something. It's, 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 you can't expect anything here. However, the Vita rockets contain computers, analog computers, because you didn't have digital computers at the time at all, but they have computers uh, in them. They have gyroscope, they have guide beams, they have all kinds of crazy stuff. They're incredibly impressive machines, and they've been developed by the Nazi scientists, and nobody else really in the world knows how to make this stuff. Um, and that's how I get to a guy called Werner von Braun, who is a Nazi scientist who is developing these uh, rockets. He basically invents them. And, uh, well, his team invents them, shall we say. And, you know, that's... It's, it, it's 
it's again one of those signs of how you can be strong, right? This is one way of being strong, by simply having insane technological superpowers. But there's, there's nothing that comes close to these. I mean, I guess maybe the US Army has kind of the same kind of technological superpowers now, with these drones that can just, you know, Trump could in principle just say, I want to bomb Liechtenstein, or Haiti, I don't know, whichever one this flag is, and you can just press a button and this magical robot just flies into the sky and bombs things without anybody even being close to it. That's kind of cool too, in a scary way, right? Kind of the same. Am I comparing Trump to Hitler? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm really not. Uh, Trump is many things, but he's not Hitler. Um, the moustache is all wrong for a start. So, what we have here is Germany being surprisingly scary. And strong as fuck. And of course, oh, did I just say that? I'm so sorry. I don't even know why I'm complaining. Who's watching this, to be honest? Fuck. So, um, we have these... These uh, these incredibly strong military powers. Of course, they fail, right? Um, because Hitler is not the world's best strategist, and he tries to invade uh, Russia, the Soviet Union, and that's, of course, not going to work, because, come on, have you tried? Napoleon tried it, he can do it, so you probably can't either. And uh, it completely fails. And this is where uh, they realize that the only way they can possibly beat the Russians is through this technological strength because they try to attack, right? They have the Battle of Stalingrad and that goes like terribly. The Eastern Front is just a massive blood destruction. It's it's not really talked about in our history books, but if you look at the deaths of the Battle of Stalingrad and basically the Eastern Front in general, it's bad. It's really bad. And everybody dies pretty much in the world. And it's really, really, really not a great day for anyone on the Eastern Front. And the Germans realize that they're just not going to win unless they have, you know, more of that cool, super cool technology that only the Germans have. So what they do, and this is fun, because it involves a Polish person playing with a toilet. <laughs> so listen up. This is good. Um, well, not playing with a toilet, but looking at a toilet, which is much better, to be honest. So we have... <laughs> I bet you're listening now, aren't you, to find out what I mean. Um, we have the Germans say, okay, the only way we can we can win is by building more cool stuff. So what they do is that they put together a list. They put together a list which is called the Osenberg List. And the Osenberg List is basically just a, a list of all the people who are, you know, in the army of Germany, like in the Nazi powers, but just doing stupid army stuff like cleaning toilets and stuff. But they are actually, they happen to have PhDs in physics and rocket science and all this kind of useful stuff. And suddenly they're kind of useful, so they are drawn back from the field and they're sort of given, given jobs developing rockets. And all those names go on the Osenberg list. Now the reason this is interesting is that the Osenberg list then of course becomes a really important document for everybody else as well because this is all the, these are all the experts who know how to build cool shit. So what happens is a Polish lab technician happens to find a piece of this Osenberg list, which of course is super, super, super secret uh, you know, for everybody else but the Germans. A piece of the list, for some reason, they tried to flush it down a toilet, and it didn't all flush, so like half of it was found by this Polish lab technician. He just looks at the toilet and goes, ooh, what's this paper? Well, let me look at it. In general, just as a tip, if you find paper in the toilet, don't look at it, for goodness sake, that's disgusting. But he did, and he found out, oh my golly, this is the Osenberg list, or at least part of it, and he sends it to MI6 in, in London, the spy service there, the secret service, and that gets to the CIA in the US, and then something absolutely batshit crazy happens. The US decide that they're going to kidnap all the Nazi scientists. Uh, this is after uh, the war has ended. Well, at least after the Germans have capitulated, and all we have left are the Jappy Jappy Jappies. <laughs> I'm sorry. Please don't call them that. I'm sorry. The Japanese army. <laughs> I don't know why I said Jappy Jappy Jappies. I don't know. I'm in a good mood for some reason. I, don't, I really shouldn't be. Um, the, ja <laughs> the Pacific War. Okay? The Pacific War is not done yet. So, <laughs> I'm so sorry. This is what happens when you can't edit. Um, so <laughs> I'm making myself laugh, at least. Um, so we have the Pacific War, and what they do is called Operation Paperclip. They basically go through this list, and they say to the people on the list, Hello, you're a Nazi. We know you're a Nazi. You are absolutely going to go in front of a war crimes tribunal when you get it. When all this is over... But we might let you off if you come and work for us in the U.S. to develop some weapons, please. 
And that's what happens. Operation Paperclip is basically a mass kidnapping of Nazi scientists to work for for um, for the Americans. And NASA is a, basically run by these German ex-German scientists who, are, uh, often enough, are quite happy to leave the Nazi system behind and actually, you know, have some freedom for once. It's, it's not like they're complaining. Um, and Werner von Braun is one of them. He's one of the, these. These guys who goes via Operation Paperclip to the Americans, and he becomes an American. He becomes a nationalized American, and not only that, he is the guy who basically invents the Saturn V rocket, the one ro the rocket that takes the Americans to the moon. So Operation Paperclip essentially is a huge part of the a huge important part of the moon landing, much later in 1969, um, which is kind of kind of weird when you think about it, but that's what happens. So. Just to point this out, right? The Germans, they lost, sure, but they had this sense of strength and unity, and basically your identity could be absorbed into this Aryan spirit. And you, you, when you see these Nazi rallies from Nuremberg and stuff, you, you recognize what I mean. You know, there is no individuality here. There's nothing, there's no, there's no sort of humanity almost. It's all become like this, you know, idealized Nietzschean version of like strength, rah, strength bar nothing yeah and that's one side of it now i have four minutes which is absolutely not enough but i will mention the other side of this because beside all that the other side of this split is the jews the jews of course which everybody knows this that's why i'm not spending time on it in this video but everybody knows of course that there was the holocaust and millions of jews were killed and that's a terrible terrible thing and what we see with the Jews, is this other side of humanity, this absolutely astonishing other side of humanity, where individual strength, strength through weakness almost, keeping your strength when everything is breaking around you, is there are so many beautiful stories about how the Jews survived this atrocity. They had nothing compared to the German machine of strength. Nothing. And yet, they kept their dignity in ways that are just absolutely beautiful. And there are so many stories about this. And the one I want to bring up is something called Shoah Music. There's a guy called Francesco Latoro, who is a music, musical historian, who has committed himself to, to um, preserving the music written in the concentration camps by Jews while they are essentially being killed by the Jewish, by the, uh, the, the the concentration camp system, we have people who are writing music, and we're not just talking about the Jews who worked in the sort of the the, the camp bands and stuff like that. There's a story, an absolutely astonishing story, about a man who was given charcoal as a dysentery medicine, and he wrote a symphony using the charcoal as a pen, and he wrote it on toilet paper. He wrote an entire symphony, which was smuggled out in the camp laundry. And Francesco Latoro is now recreating this music. He's recording it because, as he says, if the music isn't performed, it's like it's still imprisoned in the camps. It hasn't been freed yet. If that isn't one of the most powerful thoughts of freedom, not through strength, not through Aryan sort of destruction of the self almost, for in, the, in the sense of just like becoming strong against all morality this is strength through individuality through being a human for somehow keeping hold of your humanity in a situation where everything else around you is inhuman this is a story about two sides of what it means to be strong and it's about walls and what they can and what they can't do because the walls of Auschwitz could not destroy that spirit somehow it could not and to the very last minute of this episode, I just want to recommend a cartoon, a graphic novel, a comic book, basically. It's called Mouse, M-A-U-S. It's written by a guy called Art Spiegelman. And it is a story drawn as mice, and the Nazis are cats, and the Jews are mice. And Art Spiegelman's father was in Auschwitz. And it's basically a story about his experience in Auschwitz, and also what a kind of a man he's become. It's, it's like a biographical story. It is absolutely, blindingly beautifully done. 
I implore you to read it. It's it's beautiful. The drawings are simple, and you have to get over the fact that all these that it's drawn as cats and mice, you know. But once you get over that, the way it's told, it's emotional. It's it's gutting. It's absolutely beautiful, and it tells us what this side of humanity also is. Walls can do some things. They can't do everything. Thanks for watching.